Howdy, everybody. Thank you for the great introduction, Dave. Um, so yeah, I specifically called the talk more than fun, that a lot of people think about games as being purely fun, and I think there's, there's a lot more they can be um, in addition to being fun. Uh, Dave did a great intro on some of my personal background. You know, I've been doing this for way too long. I started off making some pretty small Mac games way back in the distant past. I went through the PS2 era uh, with uh, working on a bunch of stuff like The Suffering. That I was the creative director on that, that horror franchise uh, in, the, in what we call current gen right now. Uh, I did a bunch of different things on different projects, including the weird Vin Diesel driving game Wheelman and uh, Homefront, which is an occupied USA first person shooter. I'm now at uh, Microsoft, where I've worked on a bunch of big secret things, but also on some smaller stuff that's actually come out that I can mention, like did a tiny bit on, on Mark of the Ninja Deadlight. Uh, there's a game, Castle Storm, that's coming out shortly that I did some work on. So I like balancing some of the smaller projects with these bigger secret -y things that hopefully I get to tell you about someday if they, uh, if they ever come out. Uh, I also wrote the book, Game Design Theory and Practice, he mentioned. So usually when talking to a bunch of students, I find that the question most people have on their mind is, how do I get into the industry? So I thought it'd be good to just like, let's just get that out of the way if we need to talk here. Um, and I've got it summed up quickly in three slides. So the number one thing is do professional work, right? And this may seem obvious, uh, but you'd be surprised how few resumes come in from students from schools that actually have professional quality work in them. Uh, you know, and, and go out there and get an editor, right? These editors, I'm sure you're getting them here if you're going to school here. But you know, you can go grab them. They're either cheap or or free in some cases, where you can get you know you can get the Bethesda tool set, get Unreal, get Unity, start making stuff, and and make it at a professional level. You know, either build a level, script a level. You know, script entities like gameplay entities in one of these things can be you know a job that you would do as a game designer, um, and and really master some of these tools. And the key here is again doing professional work, right? We get a lot of see a lot of resumes with work in them that is in these things, but it's like, well, yeah, but that's not actually as good as a Gears of War level. That's not actually as good as a, as a, you know, a, a Call of Duty level or whatever. So it's being honest with yourself about the work you're doing and getting feedback from people who will be really critical of it and not just you know, your buddy who's like, oh yeah, man, that's awesome. And it's like, yeah, well, it's, but you wouldn't actually ship that in a game, right? Um, you know, if you're not into just purely the, the game design side of things, a great, uh, route into game design can be working in another discipline too, like gameplay programming. Uh, you know, gameplay programmers are the secret designers of the industry that they make a lot of choices as they're working that designers can't possibly prescribe all of them uh, that are crucial to making a game fun, and that can lead to a more pure game design role. Same thing with environment art. You know, that can lead to level design, or just make a full game yourself. You know, make a small indie game. And again, if it's at a, a really professional level of quality, that will show really well when you put it up on your your website, your portfolio, or some somewhere you make the playable. Of available of it even, you know, you basically want to prove that you can do the job because the people hiring are looking for someone who could come in, you know, on one of these bigger projects who can, you know, do work that's going to ship in the game, right? And you need to just prove that you can do that. The third thing you really need to do is as you go into the interview, uh, assuming, you know, that work gets you in the door, um, you know, you need to think about, you know, where you're interviewing and, and be willing to really go where the work is, right? You're, you're here in Vancouver, so that's an advantage. You have a, a bunch of studios here you could go work at. You might want to consider moving yourself to Montreal, where there's even more studios you could go work at. Um, you know, you need to be willing to pay, get paid. You know, not a ton of money out of the gate necessarily. You know, you'd be able to work really hard despite getting that maybe lower salary. Um, and when you go in, you really need to know everything about games. You go into an interview, you need to be able to talk with the game designers who are interviewing you, and they're going to be talking about the, you know, the latest hot few games, whatever they are. Right now, maybe it's like Walking Dead and Far Cry 3, something like that. Um, you know, and you need to know everything also about the place you're applying. You would be surprised how many people come in for an interview and have not played the last game that that place shipped, right? Like you're going in for an interview at this studio. You want to go in there saying, no, I want a job here. I love you guys because you did this. And maybe, you know, maybe it's not even the most romantic game in the world. It's not the most famous game in the world. But you're like, hey, I played your game. And you know, I recognize it's not a 90 plus game, but it had this awesome stuff that I liked about it. You need to go in there and talk with these people. And that will get you really far. And you'd be surprised how many people don't do that. Um, and you, you know, in that interview process, show that you can collaborate. Show that you can take direction because you're not going to be coming in at the top of the food chain at these places. Um, and you want to show that you're confident, you know, that you have an ego, that you're confident in your work, but also that you're not an egomaniac, that you're going to be willing to work with the team. So I think if you can do, you know, not to say that all of that is super easy, but um, I think it's more doable, you know, if you focus and apply yourself, particularly on doing uh, professional work, you know, I think it's fairly easy to actually get an entry-level job uh, in the industry. Um, 
The trick, though, and what this talk is about, is that once you get that job, you know, what's really hard, I find, in the industry is doing really good work once you get there. You know, a lot, you know finding work that you can do that has real meaning. So there's a lot of, of situations where you can do just, you know, the letter of the job or, you know, you can deliver something that is, you know, saddest, ticks off all the boxes but isn't really a meaningful experience. And I'm going to talk about that, you know, that's sort of the, the, the thrust of this talk is, is looking at how you can do real work that, that will resonate with people and that will be memorable and that people can take away with them. So this being the Game Design Expo, I, I imagine many of you are familiar with generally what game design is, but sometimes people have, have different ideas of what this is, and I just want to clarify how I mean it in this talk, right? So game design is not, not, not about the art, it's not about the story, it's not about audio or programming. All these things are necessary for a game to work, or most of them are necessary. Um, but it's, it's a different part is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about game design. If we compare, say, you know, film there with the Hurt Locker, The Wire is a TV show, obviously. Uh, Jimmy Corgan's a great comic book, you know, The Bell Jar is a great novel. You know, these are all interesting works of art. All of these have story, right? They all have story. Um, most of them have visual composition, you know, the, the novel format does not. Uh, many of them have acting, right? Um, but the only thing that, that sets us apart is the game design, right? We're the, that's the one thing that games have that no other medium has. And I think we often find our greatest strengths as a medium when we play to the stuff that we can do that no one else can. So specifically, when I talk about you know, that thing that we're doing, I, I, when I refer to game design, I'm talking about the rules and mechanics of the game, the systems uh, and the architecture of those systems that control the play experience. The, if the player does this, this happens. If the player does that, that happens. And how those things work together. You know, and, and you're really deeply defining what the player can do in the game and the objects that you act upon. You know, another great way to think about this, some of you may be familiar with this, is the, called the MDA framework. It's a great way of thinking about game design that you start off you know, at, a, at a root level with those rules that I'm talking about. Those are the mechanics of the game. Those play together in a certain way to create a certain dynamic situation. Uh, how those play together is how the game plays out because of the rules. Then the aesthetics is where the, the meaning starts to come in. That's you know, the human emotional responses that come out of those dynamics. It's a great, you know, it's a great paper, bunch of papers. You can read about this like on that URL that I've listed up there, or you could just Google MDA framework and get it. Um, another way that I really like to think about game design and, and game specifically is that a game is a series of interesting choices. This is a famous Sid Meier quote. Um, what does he mean by interesting choices? So say you're starting out in a game of civilization, you get a choice, do I make a settler, a scout, or a warrior? The interesting thing about this choice is that there's no right answer, right? Depends on many things. It depends on what point you're at the, at the game in. What do I need right now? You know, what's my strategy going forward? How am I going to build on which unit I build right now? So what makes this an interesting choice is at different parts in the game, the answer to this question will be, the answer to the question of what I build will be different. Uh, and there's no purely right, purely wrong way. You could build any and still win or lose. Um, and it's, it's sort of the summation of those interesting choices that makes the whole play experience. And as we're looking at, at trying to find the real meaning in games, I think we need to look beyond the things that other mediums can do and really look at how the meaning of our games can express itself through the gameplay and the game systems, and less through maybe the narrative wrapper we put around it. So another interesting example of this, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Chris Crawford, who's a famous game designer from the early 80s, wrote a, uh, 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 the first book about game design. Um, but he had made a lot of war games over the years that had done very well financially. But as, as he got more and more successful with those, he wanted to evolve into doing something a little different. So he made a game about the lead up to war. And this is sort of the first, uh, the, his most famous game as we look back on his career now. Uh, and this was a game about sort of geopolitical conflict and, and you know, maintaining this sort of delicate balance between the USSR and Russia. Um, and in this game, if you went to war, you actually lost, right? So if you, know, if, you, if you weren't able to maintain that delicate balance, the world would end. And he made a very conscious choice that you know, he's not going to glorify what happens when the war starts, right? Because it's not about that. It's about not, not letting that happen. And it's, a, you know, it's an interesting to think about, well, what was the meaning Chris was trying to get into the game through this, right? He made a, even though it was a realistic simulation of a real world situation, and there were certain expectations players had about how a game about Russia uh, and the US being uh, you know, at odds, uh, how that would play out, he could make a lot of creative choices about which things he put in, which things he didn't, that was sort of how he put his own meaning into the game. 
And this is a good quote from him about this. You know, there's often was a debate, particularly, particularly back in the 80s, there was a lot of debate in strategy games about realism versus playability. These days, you know, playability has won as it should have. Um, and people worry less and less about realism, sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but that, you know, he said when people talk about realism versus playability, it's as if it's a dilemma. I see it more as a matter of sharpening things. As an artist painting a portrait, you will uh, deliberately accentuate certain components of the face. You feel need to bring out the character of the subject. Artists don't see that as realism versus playability. They see that as art, right? Those, those choices of what you decide to simulate, what you put into it, are, you know, are driving you know, what you're trying to say with the work. So as we think about sort of summing up everything I just said, you know, the game, a game should let player make interesting choices and provide logical but artful consequences to those choices, right? You want choices that make sense given the thing that you're, you're creating in the game, given the game world, given players' understanding of the real world and its relation to your game, but also that there is an art to determining what those consequences are. And the systems that determine those consequences is the meaning of the game, I maintain, that, that as, as you are designing those systems, that which is very much a game design job, um, you are deciding what the real meaning of the game is, sort of regardless of what all of the other parts, the art or the story or whatever, are doing. And I like to call those expressive systems. These are the things that you as a player, you as a designer rather, are really allowing to, to get the meaning out is you're creating these systems which express something. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of different games that I think are good examples of this, um, just to show you some very specific uh, examples of how I think it's worst in some titles. So I'm gonna start with Walking Dead, which is very much the hot game of the moment that everybody talks about at work all the time and like, oh, what did they do right and what did they do wrong? Um, and you know, it's interesting because it's an adventure game, right? And historically, to me, adventure games are, are not really about making interesting choices. They're about figuring out what the designer wanted me to do here, right? Like, what weird gadget do I need to combine with what other gadget to get through this puzzle, right? It doesn't really feel as much like a game as it is like a puzzle. Uh, but interestingly, in The Walking Dead, you're making a lot of choices as you go through about how you, you know, relate to these different characters and what you do. And the way they designed the systems uh, into it really made it more of a game than, than previous adventure games. And I'm gonna show a clip here. This is from the first episode, so it's not a big spoiler of any kind. Um, and this is a woman you meet who has been bitten by one of the dead, and you, you know she is gonna turn and is, uh, is upset about that. Just leave me, please go. Now here's, you see their conversation system comes up. They have this- What if you turn and follow us back says, to our group? You I know, that was why I was locked away. I can't let this happen to me. You have a gun, so can and she's I gonna set up you to borrow have to make it? A very difficult what do you choice. mean, borrow? Give it to me. I can just, you know, end this, and then, and then there's no problem. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Please, I don't want to be one of them. They're, they're satanic. And here you have to decide to what's going to happen. What? You can't be serious. And notice that text comes up no. at the top of the screen right after you make the choice saying, hey, you just did something big here. Then shoot her. Huh? I've seen what hell is like, and it's coming back as one of those things. Shoot her. Help her out here. You're insane. Just take this thing. Thank you so much. I know how terrible this must be. We can't watch this. Let's go. We can't go yet. What? Why not? Because somebody needs to pick up the gun. Can't leave it. You two go on. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. So now let's take a look at, at how the gameplay mechanics in that work and work throughout the entire game to, to sort of get across the meaning that they have in, the, in that title. Um, you know, when you make these choices, the player is under time pressure to make them. As if you played other adventure games or Mass Effect or something like that, you'll find that's very different than those where you sort of have all the time in the world to think about what dialogue choice you want to make. There are tons and tons of little choices throughout the game. It's not just like, you know, do I harvest or not the little sister or something like that. It's, it's much more involved. Um, they happen both in action sequences uh, and in pure dialogue sequences. The choices you have, interestingly, have little impact on the progression of the game. Like, you get to continue to the end of the story, 
regardless of which path you take. Um, and it, has, it does have some impacts on the narrative and, and how that plays out, but not on the progression. You're, you're very seldom going to be blocked from finishing. Um, and interestingly, the choices are not clearly marked as good or bad choices. They're just thrown out as like, here's a difficult situation. What do you want to do, right? And there's no easy answers presented or, or summed up later, though you do get clear feedback that you've made a choice. This is also different than other games that have had choice systems where you would make a choice and maybe not know that you'd done anything. They have that text that shows up that says, oh, you just did something, right? Or, and often that'll come up and just say, oh, that person's going to remember you did that or whatever. Um, but you do get those re that recap at the end of the episode where it says, well, the community, 50% shows this, and, you know, or 80% or shows this, and 20% shows this, and here's where you fall on that. Again, there's no judgment there, just saying, well, here's what everybody else did. Do you agree with them? Which just makes it sort of as a nice summation of all the choices you've made. What's interesting about how these mechanics end up playing out in the game, though, is that because, because there's no repercussions on progression, um, and because the, the, the choices are under that time pressure, I maintain that, that players are able to really just make character-based choices. They're not sitting there trying to overanalyze, like, oh, what should I do here to maximize my reward later, blah, blah, blah. No, they're just saying, well, I don't know. I got to make a gut decision and go with it, uh, which I think makes it much more interesting. And players can't really game the system as much. What does this mean, though, I think, overall in the game? The, the big effect that all of these choices have is who hangs out with you sort of in the final episode, right? They're, that's the big narrative branch is really these different characters can be with you or not, depending on the choices you made. Yet, because the game still ends largely in death for most of the characters involved in it, there's sort of uh, uh, you know you're, the, this notion that we're all powerless. Even with all these choices we can make, we're all going to die eventually. It's a sort of a very nihilistic, uh, nihilistic ending, I think. That's, that's my interpretation of how these systems manifest themselves uh, in meaning in the game. So let's take a look at a very different game here. Uh, and this is uh, Nintendogs. You maybe uh, have played this, maybe not. Uh, it was not a game that I necessarily thought I was going to like. Um, and I had originally gotten a DS, and I basically bought Nintendo because I thought, hey, you know, this is a very popular game. I'm a professional game designer. I should know how these things work and why this is fun. So I got it. And it's a gorgeous game and really well done. But after playing with it for a little while, I, I very quickly, you know, was like, well, it's kind of simplistic and I don't really like dogs that much. And, you know, so I, I kind of played it for a little bit. I made a dog and started it out, trained it and stuff, but I didn't keep playing for that long. So I kind of put it aside for a while. Later, though, I had a daughter. And uh, when you know, she was really into having, to, she really liked dogs. And, and we don't have any dogs at home. But I thought, hey, well, I've got this computer dog. You could play with that. And she got from a very early age, I think it was about three, she got really into playing with the dogs um, and, and training them up and all the stuff you can do in that game. Uh, and, and was playing with the same dog that I had created earlier, this dog called Gufu. Um, and what was cool about how that game worked was it was, you know, for her age of three, it was a little advanced. You know, there were certain things she couldn't do and she couldn't read the text that would show up. So we would play it together, right? Um, so we would have this sort of, you know, nice father-daughter time with the game. Um, and what happened, though, was I remember very clearly where this happened. I was traveling for business. I was in the airport in Heathrow. My wife called me and said, oh, by the way, Goofu's gone. And uh, Gufu, if you remember, is the dog that I'd created in the game that she had been, we had been playing with together for all this time. And I'm like, what do you mean Gufu's gone? It's ridiculous. It's like, well, it's just disappeared. And I'm like, what? And I remember being like, what? No, you know, this like horrible moment. That's why I remember where I was when this happened, right? Um, and, and so when I went home, you know, we looked at the game together. And it turns out, you know, I went poking around in the interface. What happened to Gufu? I don't understand. And this amazing thing happened. So Gufu came back, right? Gufu returned. It gave me a present. And I was like, oh, this is like this genuinely emotional moment. And we were really happy about it. And I will say, though, that this was a dramatic recreation. We weren't actually taking <laughs> photos at the time. But so there's a very interesting thing that they put into Nintendogs, right? And here's how it works, right? The player starts with, with a single dog that you invest time in. Uh, the player can get up to three dogs. When you save your money, you can buy additional dogs. Um, if you stop playing with a dog for a while, as my daughter had done when she was focusing on these other new dogs she got, the dog runs away, right? It just disappears. And when you go poking for it in the interface, it returns, right? And so how does this end up playing out for players? Players who get more dogs get really distracted from their original dog. And taking away the dog makes the player appreciate the dog they just lost more. And I think the meaning of that is, you know, don't neglect your relationships. If you want to keep them, well, they're dogs or humans or whatever. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting because it doesn't play out in a cutscene. It's not like this, you know, story-oriented thing. It's just something that happens in the systems of the game, right, that reacts to how you're playing it and shows you the consequence of that. Uh, and that was a really interesting example of game meaning for me.
Now I want to move on to another game here. And this is, uh, this is a screenshot from Far Cry 2. Now, I don't know how many of you played Far Cry 2, but it's a, it's a pretty bleak game, I would say. It's, it has this very muted color palette, plays this somber music all the time, and it has game mechanics that are also you know, fairly depressing. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you an example of combat. Notice I'm not The world is this sort of, is this, this example in particular is very dark, muted colors. But to figure out where I'm going, I have to pull the map out, and I have to put the gun away to do that, right? So I'm now vulnerable whenever I get the map out. I'm sneaking up on this camp, I throw a grenade there. The interesting thing about playing this game is that it is very different than what you're used to in a first-person shooter. Useful resources are very rare. Guns jam all the time, as you saw. If you don't play with the guns that you buy in the stores, basically, the guns jam pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's no mini-map in the game. There's no pause map either. To pull the map out, I have to keep playing. I might get attacked at any time. Um, you know, it's difficult to, to save in this game. Like, to save, I have to go back to these very specific points. There's no checkpointing. There's no real fast travel. There is a fast travel system, but you can tell they kind of didn't want to put it in because it's super hard to get to, and you basically never do it. Um, and you know, the enemies, the other interesting thing about this is that the enemies just respawn constantly. Like, you'll clear out a checkpoint, and then you come back like five minutes later, oh, it's totally repopulated. And there's just this feeling of, of lack of progress in the game. Uh, and the game is, as I said, it's very stressful to play, almost depressing, right? The, all of the tone elements combined with these gameplay mechanics make it a very stressful experience. And the game is very frustrating and challenging compared to other FPSs. Now, some players really love this, and I, I love this game as well. I'm not trying to rag on Far Cry 2. I'm a big fan of it. But it is, I can see how a lot of players are very turned off by these systems and don't want to play the game. And what, is, what does it all mean, right? I think it, it says something about the nihilism of violence, right, that there's really no progress to be made through trying to, you know, you're trying to track down this arms dealer to stop something, I can't remember exactly, but it sort of leaves, it's this dark, bleak world, and you feel like a dark, bleak part of it, and you sort of, your takeaway is, I, I don't want to use a gun, God, it's horrible. Let's contrast that with uh, Far Cry 3 that just shipped recently, uh, and this is a, a screenshot from that, and you'll notice right away that there's a very dramatic color palette change even, and that the enemies, they're nice bright red, and they really pop out against the background. Uh, and overall, I would say it's a much more fun game. So here's a clip from that. The game is nicely paused while all of this happens. Whereas if they didn't find the crafting in Far Cry 2, it would have been real time while the guy was punching the so Now I can just run up, stab that guy in the throat. This guy's gonna try to flank me, but because I've seen him, I can see him through the tree. No problem finding him and killing him. And you'll notice in that whole encounter, my gun did not jam once. Because it doesn't jam at any point in the game. And it just shows you, a, it's obviously a very different feeling to the combat, right? As I get to the vehicle and drive off, it plays this nice music. Oh, that, wasn't that just a delight? So when you look at this game, you can see that it's doing something very different. But I was wondering, is there, is there like somebody who worked on this game here? Is there, oh wait, in the front row, we have the creative director of the game. Is your mic on? All right. So since I knew Pat is talking later this afternoon, I thought it would be great to, uh, get him up here to talk Just about, you know, what they were thinking when they, they made all these shifts for Far Cry 2, so, or so for Far Cry 3, rather. So yep. in this game, when, obviously, you know, we talked about how 
some of the, the game systems seem much more oriented towards fun. What were the big things you wanted to tackle shifting from the second game to, to doing this one in terms of the gameplay systems? Um, well, the, the thing is, uh, you know, it was uh, first my experience of playing uh, Far Cry 2 and I think the kind of maybe the person I am or where I was coming from and the game, the, 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 the experience I wanted to, to make. So I, previously I was you know, doing Assassin's Creed. It was that uh, big thing where it's like Assassin's Creed, it's you make you feel badass all the time. And it's, so it's the kind of uh, experience that I, I, I like because you know, it's, like it's liberating and it feels like, uh, you know, it, it feels uh, great and uh, it feels like the, anyway, it feels the stuff that I, <coughs> that I enjoy to, uh, to participate in. So, and then in Far Cry 2, I think the, you know, I, I, I saw the brilliance in it. So I played it when I was, you know, not on the team or just, uh, just as a fan. And uh, I was, there was some, for me, some, some frustration of like, I, I think it's an adventure game because I really like adventure. So that's the things like I like to like, don't punish me to explore. And then I want to, you know, go look everywhere and be teased by like, oh, this is, this thing is looking nice. I want to go see it. So that's the, the first premise of like, you know, stuff that I, that I enjoy doing. As a as a gamer, so in Far Cry, I was like, I think that there's some 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 of those things that are there. So I want to know more about Africa, and I would like to talk with more people. And then I remember one at one point, it was like that thing where I was driving a boat, and there was like that you know on a river, and it was like okay, so I can understand that I was understanding the thing with the, the bleak stuff, is but you go like oh, I need more more story or more stuff in 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 the world. So. I was uh, driving, and then I, you know, I, I was watch, I, I watched, uh, you know, uh, Apocalypse Now Redux before. It was that thing where they drive, and then they meet like that French colony mm -hmm. in the Redux mm -hmm. one, where they go like, ah, oh, somebody's going to explain me a different perspective on war. So then I saw that white mansion. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so amazing! But it was just. And I arrived there, and there was no backstory. It was just a bunch of dude randomly spawn uh, shooting at me. So <laughs> I was like, okay, so. And Far Cry 2 was already done, so me, I think it's you know saying the same thing twice is not super interesting, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I was you know not interested to work on Assassin's Creed anymore because you go like, well, it's been like, and before that I was working on the Rainbow Six, and you go like after two three games it's like meh, it's like I have nothing else to say or it's been done before, so, and uh, and then arriving on Far Cry you go like well you know, what uh, Clint did was it's already done, so I want to have a different take on it and have it so that instead of um, being that harsh thing or everything is negative uh, to talk about, you know, is uh, shooting people in the face uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, is it, you know, but, you know, is, is there stuff that, you know, is, is that making us go crazy a little bit mm -hmm. if that's what we're doing at night? Then, you know, I would want to uh, turn it on its head and go like, okay, so, you know, you know when we're playing games or like, uh, you know, Call of Duty or stuff like that, we're just shooting and it's great. Uh, and let's explore that angle. So that's why I think it's kind of thematically a successor to Far Cry 2. It can be, you know, called a, a Far Cry game, but the angle is the opposite, where everything would be fun, everything would be like, uh, Hyper real. That's what I was saying to my art directors. Like, I want more color, more pop-ups, more you know, feeling good, more jingle, more stuff, so that you know you're you're playing it and you're like, oh yeah, this is this is great. This is like oh my, this is like the island of paradise. I you know, this is my wonderland. It's uh, awesome. Or and um, and then after that, introduce, and that, so that was the, the, the first thing, and then introduce some stuff in the, the narrative where um, is that, you know, maybe some, turn it on its head and then ask question for players if they, 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 they say, like, uh, is it uh, okay? Is my character, you know, is going a little bit crazy? Uh, but, you know, it's not driving it too much, uh, but it's to start opening doors for for. You know, players to start, you know, questioning why is it like uh, so colorful, so blah blah blah, blah so see people through walls. Why is right. it like that? You know, fun music playing everywhere and dubstep <laughs> and stuff like that. So, um, so that was the the uh, the 
the the, the vision for right. for the game. And do you think that the the you know you sort of have that you know really fun gameplay on top, but then with this slightly subversive you know you know your friends are are becoming pissed at you for be or like distant from you at least because yep. you're turning so crazy. Do you think that that players got that? You know, do you think that it worked out that players were able to to see that, or did they just say, oh, "This is fun, I love it." Well, Okay, so the experience was, uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, probably not as much as other games. Like you play spec up the lines and it's super clear and it's like, you know, and you, everybody gets the message. Um, because the thing is, I think if you don't finish the game or you're not looking for, for it, uh, it's not going to, like, for for most people, it's going to be like, ah, uh, oh, this is awesome, I like to play this game, and there's some tigers attacking me, I can punch <laughs> sharks. And uh, and I think that there's a lot of people, for a lot of people, that's okay. You know, that's what they're looking for, they just want entertainment. And uh, it's for me, I have no problem with that. Right. It's interesting, too, in games that if you have, and I've talked about this uh, with on my own projects, that so few players play through to the end, yep. right, of the, of the, you know, like 20% or something like that, that if your subversion of your meeting is at the end, like well, a lot of players will just never see it, and they'll be completely, yeah. whereas something like, like Far Cry 2 is more frustrating to play, but is consistent, you know, the whole way yep. it's bark and bleak. And, so, uh, well, I think it was part of the, that experience, uh, that, that experiment, sorry. Mm -hmm. Experience is experiment in English. <laughs> um, so uh, that was the gamble. The gamble was like, okay, so because you know, at the same time, the production was super tight. So I, I joined the project uh, like uh, 18 months before it shipped, and uh, technically, we're supposed to ship in March at first, and then it yeah, was right. pushed back, <laughs> and it got pushed back to December. So uh, the thing was like, okay, so let's make, uh, let's make for, well, the first thing was like, the, when I arrived, there was nothing. There was like the, the vast scene where he talks about insanity. And that was because the writer of the project saw the project fail multiple times and go like, this is crazy. And they're just, you know, they want to do another vertical slice and they're going to say, <laughs> the management is going to say, no, this is not good. And then they keep punching their heads on the wall. So that they, uh, so he made that speech about insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting things to change. So that was uh, another commentary on games. It was a commentary on on the production of Far Cry. So, <laughs> I, so I arrive, I have that, that character in. And the other thing that was not movable was the jungle. Right. But then after that, there was the nothing. So I arrived with the, okay, and my experiment was like, okay, I just come from Assassin's Creed and I want to make uh, the action adventure game in first person. So uh, that was the first initial uh, creative uh, thing. So, and I'm a game designer, so my creativity comes from a lot of systems. And then after that, from the systems, we can find uh, a story around. So the thing was like, okay, I want an action adventure game, and um, uh, it's going to be set up in the jungle, and it's a guy with a machete. And uh, the other thing is that I didn't really want to make a shooter because, you know, so, uh, and I was like, Pat, go ship that game. And then I was like, ah, it pissed me off. So uh, is a guy killing uh, people with machete can finish uh, good? At the end, can you ride on the sunset and have saved the princess? I said, nah, <laughs> it's not my, it's, I, I can't say, I can't express that. So all that, those things were kind of the starting building block of like, okay, it's going to be an open world action adventure uh, and with a guy that plays with a machete and it's not going to finish uh, good. And after that, the second thing was like, okay, I would like to, uh, at some point, have a young guy. So the story of that, I would want to have it a young guy instead of the veteran, a young, innocent guy that would be in a mode where he would say yes to crazy stuff. So, you know, it's like, okay, so we have that, that crazy guy, Vass, and then it's like, oh, Vass, Vass, Vass is great. And we go at E3, and that was the only thing that we had at that point. We only had that demo, no story, nothing, the, 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 the main character name, was Jason Brody, and we stuck with it, but that's it. He was a name. So, uh, and then I was like, okay, it's going to be, in, it would be interesting to have, at the end, I have a guy with a machete, it finished, you know, not, maybe not super great, and uh, it would be interesting to, uh, to play or to experiment or to talk uh, about, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to go with a Gen Y guy, 
And, I, and then a lot of people said, oh, you know what, Pat, this is a bad idea. I don't like this. And then the, me, the more people that says that it's a bad idea, the, the more I'm going to do it because I'm a, <laughs> I guess I'm a, I'm a punk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then it started with like, okay, so then I have that young guy that would say yes to a crazy experience. And then the idea was that to have uh, to meet uh, 10 characters uh, that are going to give us missions. And every character would be kind of off. Uh, because they are stuck on the crazy jungle. So then it was the jungle fantasy uh, with crazy guys in it. Then you go, okay, so that, you know, then it gives us a framework. And uh, then it's the young guy, so it's an initiatic uh, journey uh, where he goes like ordinary guy and then he becomes, uh, you know, at midpoint, he becomes the, uh, the video game hero. Right. And then after that, it's the, it's the descent to, uh, you know, I've made all this and is it, you know, been at the end of the day uh, worthwhile. And then once we got that uh, young guy, the, the advantage was that uh, we could introduce the RPG system and it made sense because then the guy doesn't know, you know, he's not a military guy, so he comes with, you know, less experience and then we can introduce more skills. Uh, and then circling back to the jungle fantasy and being in first person, me, I was kind of frustrated because you know, in, in Assassin's Creed, it's easy to make the guy appear more skillful by giving him more armor. Right. Then it's just by visual, people go like, okay, this is a noob, and then he gets the robe, and then he gets like more swords, and it's like, oh yeah, I see this guy is, you know, is getting old. Right. But you know, first person is just ends. Yeah. So then it was like, okay, so what I won't, and then at some point it's like, okay, we're going to have the skill tree on the ends, because that's the, on, the, on the arm, because that's the only thing we can, can see. see and then we're going to be able to see the progression all, at all time on the screen. And since we're going jungle, then it was like, okay, so the jungle fantasy, we're going to have that tribal Maori tattoo. And, and, and then it's like, and then, you know, the, 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 the drugs or the, 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 the you, know, take, you know, taking potions to go through vision quest and stuff like that started to appear and then it, it kind of created the, 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 the vision. But it kind of right. all started yeah, yeah. with that thing where it's going to be that, you know, action adventure, great, I'm going, I, I'm in the jungle, it's colorful and, and having and and using those system after but it's, that. It's interesting that as you said, like, hey, I want the mechanics that support all of this. It was really that drove then. Well, the story we can tell is this. Yep. You know, it's not the, the more negative story at Far Cry True. It's that this is the empowerment fantasy, but then sort of the twist on the empowerment fantasy. Yeah. Then after that, it goes to at some point. You know, at Ubisoft, there's some crazy rules about like uh, you cannot do this. It's not realistic or blah blah. So then I was like, no, I'm going to have a 200 feet uh, bus fight. You know, bus and I'm going to fight him and it's going to be great and 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 you know management are going to be forced to say okay yes it works <laughs> and then and it was that thing about uh, and i think that that bus fight for me epitomized the the vision which is because uh, we discussed that uh, before uh, when i was on uh, assassin's creed and the meaning of like you know and when you fight with sword it's more personal so when you fight with there's a distance with uh, with guns so it makes you feel uh, uh, Less connected to yes. the enemy, right? But and the, the the other thing is that you know it's the the gun is a penis thing because it's a phallic object yep. on screen and you're shooting it and it's like it makes you feel yes. <laughs> so it makes yes, but it's you know. <laughs> but when it's when you, I think a, a first person sword game would be more yes true in the you know so. <laughs> And then, so the point is, okay, I'm going to express that the gun is a penis, and it makes it like, like I have a, you know, a big gun, uh, with that thing where, we're, when we're going to fight the monster, we're going to be hallucinate, and the, 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 that fight, and when you wake, because you're, you're doing it when you're drugged, and it's an hallucination, and you're fighting that thing, and you have that princess that tell you you're so badass and so great, and then when you wake up, you had sex with her, so the, the bus fight was literally you having sex, with uh, with the the princess that you wanted to have, and when you, you, if you finish that fight at the end, you're like the monster collapses, and then you have to uh, climb and poke the eye with your knife until it's squirmed. It's squirt. So uh, so anyway, so it was part of that uh, that thing. So I, I maybe maybe there's some. It's interesting that these meanings aren't necessarily people things people would pick up on. Yeah. So but. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that the, if it's done correctly, they're not going, 
most people are not going to go, ah, yes, I understand this exactly, but right. they're going to feel the right, the, the emotion I want them to feel. To feel. Yeah. And if they want to think about it, it's going to work or not. So for some people, it, uh, I think the, the meaning of Far Cry work, for a lot of people, uh, uh, or for, not a lot, but it's like there's another part that for them it doesn't work. Or they don't. But they still don't, enjoy the game, but yes, they don't get sort of the narrative exactly. or the, the meaning underpinnings but, of it. But you know, it's, and at the, the other thing is, for me, it's not super important. I, I didn't want it to be like uh, too much in your face. So, uh, but it's there. So some people right. go like, okay, now I understand the, the feeling. If if somebody would want to talk about it, I think it's great to discuss cool. uh, that. But it was to uh, see those elements. Cool. All right. I think I'm gonna have to cut okay. you off there. Yes. Thanks sorry. Very much. Pat Plourd, everyone. He's uh, going to be around this afternoon. All right, so we've talked a lot about Far Cry 3. I sort of went over these points, you know, the, that feeling of empowerment and the romp, but that idea of violence can be seductive. So I'm going to charge forward here because I fear we're going over time. Um, I did want to make a, t a quick tangent point about usability. This was something Chris talked about in the, in the first session. You know, of you know, how important Microsoft feels that usability research is. Uh, and the interesting thing about Far Cry 2, it feels like, is they wanted to make this more bleak game, but I personally feel like they went too far with those systems, that the systems were so frustrating that some players just didn't want to play it at all. And I think in usability testing, you know, if you, if you do a session right, you know, this is different than focus testing. Focus testing is usually run by the marketing department, and they just want to find out how many units they're going to sell so they can decide how much marketing money to spend on it. Um, you know, with real usability, it's run by the team, like by the development team, and you get to work with the, you know, whoever's running it. We call them usability researchers at Microsoft. You know, work with them to say, here we want player to feel this. And it doesn't always have to be we want them to be happy, but maybe we want them to be frustrated somewhere, but they can see how frustrated players are getting from that stuff. Um, Always, if you can, watch these sessions yourself because it's so revealing to watch people play your game who are not your friends and you're not even in the room and you don't, they don't know you and they're just like, this is horrible. And you're like, oh God, it's not working. Uh, it's really good for game designers to do that. Um, and you can see if you're overdoing it with some of these systems that you might be trying to make the player feel frustrated by guns jamming. You know, I think they could have made the guns jam maybe a quarter as much and still had a really a, a different effect to the shooter without frustrating so many players, right? Uh, and, and always leave time to fix it. And keep your meeting in mind as you're doing usability testing. It doesn't have to always be fun all the time, 100% maxed out fun. But if players don't find it fun at all, they will, uh, they will tend to not want to keep playing your game. And then, you know, they're going to lose the meeting, right? They're not going to get anything out of it. So there's a delicate balance there. All right. So... Something about meaning, and I'm going to try to go quickly here because I've gotten assigned how much time I have left. Um, you know, something about meaning in games is, as, as we've talked about it here today, it's been a very narrative sort of surface level, you know, meaning that you can get of like almost fortune cookie life lessons. Um, but I don't think all artwork necessarily has meaning like that, right? Some things are much more subtle. Um, so, for example, in, uh, you know, when you listen to the Goldberg Variations, is played by Glenn Gould, famous Canadian. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a meaning and weight to listening to that, but it's not like it's like this exact lesson you can apply to your life. Same thing in great artwork like architecture, right? This is the Flatiron Building in New York City, one of my favorite buildings. Uh, what does this building mean? Like, it's a great piece of architecture, and it's very, you know, looking at it, you really feel something, but it's not something you can necessarily articulate. And we need to think of some games will have a meaning that isn't so surface, that isn't so like, oh, I should take care of my dog or it's going to run away, right? So a great example of that is, is Journey from last year, right? This very beautiful game that, that has a real weight to it as you play it. And as I'm sure you know, in this game, it's all about playing together with other players. And the game has a lot of systems that, that make that work in, in subtle ways, uh, in ways that encourages you to work with other people in ways that are different than how you might play other games. So you can see here I've just, as I've been playing, someone randomly shows up in my game world seems random to me, but actually there's a lot of game systems matching them up with me behind the scenes and putting them in the same place as me. And the thing they did was they put in a mechanic where, you know, you can talk to the person easily and there's no way to attack each other. And you get this little extra ability when you're close to someone is that you can jump higher. So because this person is nearby and has been pinging me, I can now do this jump up those steps that I couldn't normally do, right? And this, this is enough to make players really want to play this game collaboratively. And, you know, as you can see, as we can then make this jump up to this top platform, he just does it on his own. I use those little, you can play the game totally single player too. You know, those little floaty ribbon things can help elevate you too. You have to find where they are. But if you're playing with someone else, it's much easier to progress through. Um, and what is 
is, what does this mean in this game, right? Um, you know, when making this game, Genova Chen, the creative director, said that he, you know, a lot of people saw players playing online as assholes, right? But uh, did, they, did they really have to be that way was his point. None of us, in what he said, is none of us was born to be an asshole. I believe that very often it's not really the players that's an asshole, it's the game designer that made them an asshole. If you spend every day killing one another, how are you going to be the nice guy? All console games are about killing each other or killing one another together. Don't you see? It's our games that make us assholes. Um, and I think the point being that you, know, you see some of the mechanics that are at work in Journey here, that players are sort of automatically matched up. I don't need to go find someone. I don't only play with my friend. In fact, I can't play with my friends. I have to play with random people. Um, you know, there's this easy way to communicate back and forth. You get that super jump ability, which helps you progress if you're playing cooperatively. Um, and I think it subtly manipulates the speed of the different characters to keep them together, right? You can't, if it's sort of this rubber banding effect where it keeps players together by helping you catch up if you're behind and slowing the other guy down a little bit, not so much that you notice when you're playing, but enough that it, that it keeps the two of you going together. And the result of this, how it plays, players want to play this game cooperatively. It feels beautiful to play it cooperatively. Everyone does it. No one, I don't know anybody who like charged through the game is like, I saw someone else and then I ditched them. I don't care about that, right? That's not what happens in this game. What does this actually mean? I don't, you know, I think the meaning's a little more nebulous, just like Glenn Gould or the Flatiron Building. You know, what, what exactly this game says about life is something about togetherness, I don't really know, but you can tell as you're playing it, there's a real weight and meaning there. And it's, it, it's what makes that, that game beautiful. So I want to do a quick case study on a couple of projects I worked on and how we put meaning into those games. Um, this, the first one is where it was a little bit less successful, and this is Homefront, which is a occupied USA first-person shooter that I, I worked on, and, and in the interest of full disclosure, I was only there for about half the project, um, but I set up a lot of the world and, and the story and stuff. Um, and in this game, you're really fighting to reclaim you're fighting in the resistance movement. These were the creative pillars we started out with, was fighting in the resistance movement to claim your home. Uh, and you, have, you fight in this occupied USA post pico oil world where we had this notion that the familiar has become alien. We wanted to show a bunch of moments where you get to see sort of what the world is like after, after the world has collapsed. And I'm going to start this clip Good of morning, this. Good morning, Montrose. You're listening now, to Post Peak Oil is this idea that all the oil has run out, and so all the devices they have are going to have to run off of um, more primitive needs going back to a local insurgent group. society. KPA authorities are searching for con <sighs> Propaganda. Glad you're awake. So you take more punishment than a man could live through. Come on outside when you're ready. I'll show you around. So this scene is really good at showing how the resistance movement has to live in these abandoned suburban homes and hide from the, the occupying force that's led by the North Koreans. Um, you, get, you see how they've, they've repurposed things, like they have all these plants growing everywhere. This is how they make enough food to live. They have to grow, grow all their own stuff. The pilot's up. We'll be moving out during the next patrol gap. And this is an area called the Oasis, where they have Come taken on. the back of three suburban homes and combined them into one field where they can start doing agriculture again. Here comes so I'm going to move on to now an example of, of the, the, the gameplay in the game. Him. Now, remember I said it was about fighting in the resistance movement. They're trying to head us off. Spare and I think that's really where, unfortunately, the game you know, didn't work out. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons for that. A lot of them were schedule, and it's really hard to make innovative gameplay. And we talked a lot about how are we going to make this feel like you're fighting in the resistance. Uh, at the end of the day, there just wasn't, you know, and we tried a lot of things that didn't work out. And in the end, we ended up falling back to, to tried and true sort of Call of Duty game mechanics. Um, but it really lost that feeling of being in the resistance. And I feel like the game was a little bit discordant as a result of that. Um, so. Let me talk a little bit about something that worked out a little bit better. And this is a game, The Suffering, that I worked on. This is an action horror game where you're this prisoner taken to this island, uh, and you're uh, found guilty of, uh, of having murdered someone. You're going to be executed, and you have to escape. And this actually, and it's a very bloody, gory, sort of over-the-top horror game in a lot of ways, but it also deals with a lot of fairly serious themes. Um, you know, this is a great quote from Bernard Rose, who directed one of my favorite horror movies, Candyman, about you know, talking about how that in that movie dealt a lot with issues of slavery. I encourage you to watch it thinking about that. Because you know, he was able to make it because no one pays attention to that. As this quote says, you know, in a horror film, you can address something like slavery, which if you addressed it in a straight drama, all the corporate naysayers would say, oh, we don't want to talk about that. 
But in a horror film, they say, oh, it's just some garbage, just some nonsense for the kids. So as we were looking at the suffering, you know, I had a lot of inspirations from great horror movies that I liked, but also a lot of material that I was reading at the time, like dealing with like, the real life of, of someone being a, a prison guard uh, at Sing Sing, to, to dealing with the death penalty, to sort of you know, various atrocities of the United States over the ages. So we were able to do things like theme all of the different enemies after, uh, after different execution methods. Um, so you had like everything from old stuff like beheading to modern stuff like lethal injection and deal with a lot of sort of the uh, horrific events of US history. Um, you know, everything from the slave trade to, to ethnic discrimination. And, and the horror setting was really an ideal wrapper for dealing with a lot of these topics. Um, because upper management, you know, if they'd been completely aware of what we were doing, might not have liked it as much. But they're like, oh, it's just some bloody horror nonsense. It's great. So how is that supported in the hey. gameplay systems? Is in, there? You know, in the game, you meet these Hello. different companions that you get to spend time with, right? Um, here's one of them. Look at these. Man, sweet, it's sweet good to see another magic. human. Wait, what the f? Tor, is that you? F it's me, Dallas from Easton. Man, if anybody could survive this, I guess you could. You seen some of these things, man? F my gun is still I up heard here. the government's been conducting experiments on us inmates. Next phase of MK Ultra, if you can believe that. Now it's turned into the mother of all cluster. F he needs your protection. He's a parasite. And you end up getting this feedback from these carry this sort of angel and, and demon that are on your shoulder, encouraging you to either try to help them or try to kill them. And the player is left to do what they want with that person's life, right? And um, you know, in the suffering, you're able to survive in the world, but it's it's kind of challenging. And having these companions along with you makes it a little bit easier, but it's also challenging to keep them alive, and they can permanently die at any time. You know, narratively, uh, Teammates all have a, they all have a unique relationship to you. That guy's your old buddy. You know, other characters, uh, you know, are actually hostile to you and are prison guards who hate you. Um, and how you treat your teammates really ends up defining the, the ending of the game you get. And this is a little bit of gameplay meaning, I think, you, connecting with the themes of the game about sort of the preciousness of human life or something. I'm not going to say exactly the, the, the meaning that was supposed to come out of it, but this was something fairly different for this genre that, that supported some of the issues uh, we wanted to work with. I'm, I'm almost done. I see your finger. Um, and I'm going to skip the next section. And it's it's going to be OK. But you know, I think trying to make meaningful gameplay in a game can be really difficult, because as you're in a development group, you will find that not everybody is into making something with meaning. right? A lot of them are just like, it should just be fun. Why are we talking about all this heavy meaning stuff? This is a waste of time. But I think you know, if you decide, hey, this is important. I want to say something with the game I'm designing. You know, deciding that you want to do it, deciding what that meaning is, working you know, wherever you are in the team, working with upper managers to say, hey, is this what you guys are thinking, and making sure you're aligned. Um, you know, not every place is Ubisoft where they talk about this stuff openly. A lot of other places are very hostile to doing this sort of more meaningful gameplay stuff. Um, but you'll find team members who are on your side. And finding those people on the team and talking to them and working with them can get you really involved. And then for the players who don't like it, who don't want to deal with meaning, remind them that the game's still really fun and it's still this gory horror game or whatever. Um, and they'll be OK with that, right? And you can, they can just focus on that part of the game. You can focus on your more meaningful part. Uh, and make sure the game is still fun for those who aren't into the meaning. I, again, I think that's where Far Cry 2 went off the rails a little bit. And just be thoughtful about, about all your gameplay systems. And I'm going to skip this next thing here, get right to my ending. Um, does anybody remember War Games? I might be dating myself by bringing this movie up. Uh, but in this, in this movie, you know, the, this kid has accidentally hacked into NORAD, and it's like there's this nuclear, uh, the, the total nuclear war game that he's playing. I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, and uh, he has the computer is taken over and decides it wants to bomb the Russians. And he has to go in and try to hack into the computer and stop it. And he ends up teaching it this lesson by having it play tic-tac-toe with itself, right? And it realizes, oh, wait, tic-tac-toe is a game where no one wins. Once you figure out the game, you know, there's uh, only, only stalemates. Uh, and the computer gets this lesson of, oh, strange move. Only, the, only, the only winning move of this game is, is not to play. And that's the lesson it gets out of it. And how about a nice game of chess? Uh, I think a game of chess with Charlie's Angels would be a particularly meaningful one. But specifically, I think that um, having, you know, I think as, as players, we often think players are just in it for entertainment. They don't really care about this stuff. But I think from a very young age, when people play games, they're trying to imbue them with meaning, right? Here's this girl playing hopscotch. She's made it that the winning condition of the game is going on a honeymoon with someone. Uh, you know, it's like when you're playing a pickup baseball game or a, a pickup game of hockey in the street or whatever, you're thinking, hey, this is the final game of the Stanley Cup, and oh my god, this is the, you imbue it with all this meaning that goes beyond the actual mechanics of the game. And I think players are really looking for this stuff. 
you know, when, you know I, I love this picture too, that there's all these girls playing these diff this game and I don't really know what all this is. There's colors and girls and cars and, and look at these kids, they're so focused. This is like their world has been taken over and they're, they're eager for some meaning out of the game that they've added it themselves. And as we think about games, you know, being a little bit more than fun, think about the sort of difficult choices we have to make in something like The Walking Dead, or the choices that we don't even know we're making until we see the outcome of them in something like that, or, or you know, our, you know, feeling the nihilism of violence, or just feeling how good it is to play together with other people when the game supports that, it can really allow us to have, to have games that are a bit more than fun. Thanks.